All right, so our next speaker is Jinchuo Dong. He decided to hue quite precisely to the uh, title of the workshop, Beyond Differential Privacy, and he's going to propose uh, a definition that goes beyond differential privacy. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, it's really a great honor to be standing here. But I'm actually violating the, the, violating the rule because it's still differential privacy, right? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so in order to have your attention, let me say something uh, controversial. <laughs> Epsilon and delta are the wrong parameters to use for differential privacy. Okay, okay so, so this is just too wrong for me to even walk out of the room. Um, uh, let me say something more fair. A single Epsilon delta is usually not enough to describe the mechanism, uh, the privacy of the, me of the mechanism. But the entire collection of epsilon delta, meaning that uh, for each non-negative epsilon we have a delta, that is enough, that is sufficient. And uh, we have a uh, equivalent but uh, better way to do it. Right, so this is just what I just said. And uh, so the equivalent perspective is called FTP. And uh, it makes things algebraically nice and clean. And I'll elaborate. So I'm going to show you some sampling theorem, composition theorem, and also a central limit theorem, which is why uh, the title is called uh, Gaussian DP. Um, JDP for short, and hopefully it doesn't offend uh, potential economists sitting here. <laughs> yeah. So let me uh, start with the uh, basics. What is differential privacy? So differential privacy is the property of a randomized algorithm. Okay. So it's a property of the randomized algorithm. Uh, we are using the standard notation here that S and S prime are, are neighbors if they differ by one individual. Okay. So the time-tested idea of these people is that uh, uh, there's, there are adversaries trying to distinguish whether it's S or S prime. Uh, based on the outcome in, in Y. And if they cannot do too well, then uh, we have some privacy. Okay, uh, this is naturally casted in uh, uh, a hypothesis te testing language because the adversary just faces a hypothesis testing problem, right? Uh, so they're trying to distinguish whether this is it's this case or, or is this case. And to remind you that uh, M, it, because M is a randomized algorithm, this and this are all uh, distributions. I'll call them P and Q. Okay, um, so a little recap of uh, hypothesis testing. For a, a test means, or a rejection rule, it means when you see an outcome Y, little y, it returns a number between zero and one. So that number is the probability you reject, meaning that you, you decide it's Q and not P. So for each test, you have a type 1 error and type 2 error. <coughs> type, type 1 error is when it's actually P, but you think it is Q. Type 2 error is uh, when it's actually Q, but you think it is P. Okay. And we have a fundamental trade-off between these two errors. Uh, you can think of it as uh, um, when you are allowed a larger type 1 error, you can definitely achieve a, a smaller type 2 error. So we can ask this, this question. What is the smallest type, type 2 error if I am um, given a fixed level of type 1 error? And this gives you a, a, ma a, a function mapping from uh, type 1 error to the minimal type 2 error. And this function is associated with P and Q. So I'll denote this function by T of PQ. So it still takes in alpha and returns a minimal beta. So this is the, the expression. The, the, the minimum is taken over uh, uh, all possible tests. Okay. And, and, and it's a mean, not an not a inf, because of uh, neyman pearson lemma. Okay, so if we put a, put a lower bound on this function, then it means we cannot achieve a uh, uh, small type, type 2 error. So that will mean uh, the problem is hard to distinguish. 
So here comes the, the observation of Larry Wasserman and Zhou Shuheng uh, almost a decade ago that a mechanism is up to now the DP if and only if the, uh, the trade off of neighboring distributions uh, is lower bounded by, by this function. This function looks like this. So it bas it's basically a linear function. We, we have this part because uh, the symmetry of S and the S prime. Uh, that means when you switch S and S prime, you, you, you switch the uh, uh, new and alternative hypothesis. And hence, you, you, you switch type 1 and type 2 errors. So you just do this. So you definitely have, if you have this, then you definitely have this. Okay. Um, <coughs> the question you can ask is, why just linear? So that motivates our definition of FDP. For an f, which is a fun function from 0, 1 to 0, 1, um, if a, a mechanism is said to be fdp if the trade off of neighboring dist distributions is lower bounded by f. Okay. And this is what it looks like. If f is the solid line and the trade off of neighboring distributions looks like this, then we do have uh, uh, fdp. And I, I want to emphasize that this must hold uh, point wise for all numbers between 0 and 1. A concern may be that uh, a general function is not, uh, uh, it's not a good class. You we might want regularity condition on it, because it, it could be super oscillatory. It doesn't make sense to use an oscillatory, oscillatory function. So uh, an idea I think makes sense is that we use an f that looks like this, looks like a trade-off of, of distributions. So that, uh, then a, a, a question arises, how do we characterize a function? How do we know that uh, a function is, is, looks like this or not? And here comes the fundamental theorem of trade-off functions. Uh, a, a function 0, 1 to 0, 1 is convex, non-increasing, continuous, and uh, below this, if and only if there are distributions such that f equals tp. That is nice. I, I, uh, we can just work with this class of function. I'll, I'll, de I'll denote the, the class of function by categorical f. And uh, you'll see that there are some uh, like algebraic structures on, the, on this on this flash. And another nice thing is we have nice interpretation. It's like if this holds, then well, what does it mean? It means telling whether your inside is harder than distinguishing uh, p and q if f equals tpq. Okay. And there are a little, there's a little technical issue, and I want to, I want to uh, review the symmetry between s and s prime, you know, the, the thing I mentioned before. But when you switch the type 1 and type 2 error, you, you, uh, you get f inverse, right? Uh, <coughs> so I'll just impose the f equals f inverse. Otherwise, I'll just take the max of f and f inverse so that it's, uh, it's really symmetric. So, so you can take that for, for granted. OK, so these are all definitions. Uh, before I make the first uh, real point, let me at least tell you what the title means. Are you ever slightly confused? Maybe it's my confusion and misunderstanding. But the way I see it is that the um, property of the uh, Wasserman and Jew came out as a side effect of the epsilon delta. Um, and, it, and it really does talk about a distinguisher that uses all values of L. But it seems like you're requiring it as a definition. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, or I'm trying to understand what's the conceptual logic between for looking like these at all values of alpha. Because if, if I'm looking at an alpha which is, say, very close to 0.5 or even 0.5 itself, what, what does it matter? It's a, it's a, you know, it's a distinguisher that doesn't really tries to distinguish between S and S prime. That, that is a, like, you're, a reasonable you're, question, but uh, so you can develop different kind of theory based on different relaxations. I, I'm just presenting a, a, a specific kind of relaxation, and it has a lot of nice property that I'm going to, okay. I'm going to show. Okay. okay, so what, what is uh, GDP is, uh, Resulted from uh, taking f to be a particular 
uh, trade-off function is uh, the, the testing problem of normal zero and normal mu one. I'll call this function g sub mu. It's still a function. Okay. The definition is, so m is mu GDP if it's g mu dp. So like, do you see how commutative it is? <laughs> that is the algebraic thing I mentioned. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not talking. I'm kidding. <laughs> so the, 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 the interpretation is even nicer. It's even nicer. And telling whether you are inside is uh, harder than telling apart normal zero and normal mu one. OK. Uh, so uh, here's a plot that uh, gives you a sense what, how, how mu affects this, this function. You can see that it's really similar to, to those corresponds to, to epsilon pure, pure dp, right? You have 0 0.5, 1, 3, and the invisible 5 here. Uh, 0.5, 1, 3, and the invisible 5 here. Okay. And these are all symmetric. <coughs> now here comes the first point. It's uh, the, so the equivalence of using f and using the, the whole collection of f and delta. So this is best illustrated by this, this plot. So we can consider the following question. If I give you that uh, m is f dp, and I want to I want to ask uh, what kind of epsilon delta dp does it satisfy? So what, what what do you do? Because epsilon delta corresponds to linear functions or roughly linear functions, <coughs> you just form a linear lower bound. Right? So what is the tightest possible epsilon delta? That is the uh, the super, supporting linear function. And what does that remind you? It reminds you of convex conjugate. So th that, that's what I, what I mean by uh, f is primal and epsilon delta is dual. <coughs> if you work the detail out, you have this uh, formula. Uh, it's equivalent to the collection of epsilon delta dp uh, with uh, del epsilon delta are related by this function. Um, yeah, so I have argued the, the equivalence. I also want to argue the sufficiency of using f or, or epsilon delta in infinite collection. Uh, that is actually an attempt to answer this question. What should be used to quantitatively describe privacy? So it's kind of a big question. Uh, and my answer to it uh, is related to, to uh, post processing. Let me first tell you what is that we do have post-processing for, for FDP. Okay, so, so post-processing, it can turn a, a term P into P prime and Q into Q prime. So you should expect that P prime and Q prime are, are only harder to distinguish than the original P and Q. Okay, so formalized in terms of trade-off, it's just you can, you can only achieve larger uh, type two error for this problem than this problem. Okay, so this is a fact and uh, we do have so, so we do have a uh, post-processing property of, of F. Okay, so to argue or to answer this question, let me tell the story in a slightly different way. So I'll say that PQ, this pair, is easier to distinguish than P prime, Q prime in the, in the Blackwell sense if there's a post-processing such that uh, turns P A to P prime, Q to Q prime. So, so I, I didn't term this, 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 this it already existed for, for more than 60 years, and it's highly related to this campus. Okay. And uh, how should we perceive this kind of ordering? We can, it, it's the most straightforward uh, representation is, a, is set theoretic. So I just collect all the valid inequalities implied by this ordering. That I'll call uh, L Blackwell. Okay, so that's a, like a catalog that you can look it up, which one is easier, which one is harder. We can form similar orderings uh, by uh, looking at the quantitative description of privacy. For example, if you use, we use trade-off, then this is easier than this in the trade-off sense if the, the trade-off is less than this. And if we, we want to use Renyi divergence, then this is easier than, than this if the divergence is larger. Okay? So these are all valid uh, orderings. And we can also form this kind of listing of all the valid inequalities. In general, it's, it's also true. 
And well, what, uh, what would that mean? So, so what would uh, post-processing property look like in this kind of language? Post-processing means whenever you have this, you must have this. Right? If like, uh, in the post-processing mean, uh, since it's easier to distinguish, distinguish then you must have the, 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 the similar composition. So that means this list is a sub, subset of this list. This one, Blackwell list, is also a, a, a subcollection or subset of this uh, collection. So these are all these are all true. Okay, so why do I complicate things like this? Um, you see. So the, so, so the first punchline is that uh, this kind of list, whatever quantity you use to describe privacy, you you cannot be. This list cannot be too short. It has to contain the Blackwell's list. So Blackwell has this short list, minimal list that, that you have to be consistent with. And uh, we have a slightly, potentially slightly longer list. But maybe like Mr. Bean comes and says, well, why, why don't I have the, the, the longest possible list by using this trivial divergence? Everything is equal to zero. So that you have every inequality is, is valid. So, so that's uh, the longest possible list. This one is not informative at, at all. Right? So maybe this would suggest that the list cannot be too long. And here comes the, the great theorem of Blackwell that Blackwell's list is equal to the trade-off list. So if you think of this as um, going from here to here is uh, losing information, then this thing is the most informative. So, okay, so, so this is, you, you may, so from, from here to here is just by heuristic. And uh, you may disagree of this, this statement, but at least I want to point out that this is a, a relevant theorem. Okay. So far I, am, uh, I have argued that Two points, one is equivalence, or one is informativeness. And you may disagree with this, but th this is way behind schedule, so let me. So, so the next part is that uh, this kind of FDP have, uh, I, 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 I call it algebra of differential privacy, because all of this important theorem corresponds to <coughs> algebraic uh, properties of the function. So, so schedule, so let me just skip this group privacy. I just want to point out that it corresponds to function composition. Um, so sub something, that's more important. Um, the theorem looks like if M is FDP, then if you, if you first do, the, do a sub sampling, um, so, so the, the sub, -sampling, sub sampling scheme doesn't really matter because, um, well you can think of it as taking a a mini batch uh, uniform at random. Okay, so if you do sub sampling first and then apply M, then it's going to be this much DP. So what, what does this thing do? This thing does uh, average and convexify. So let me explain. So so first, okay. So I missed the point that uh, so this line, this line is like you are trying to distinguish two identical things. Then the only thing you can do is is to random guess. Right? That corresponds to type one error plus type two error equals one. So, so this corresponds to uh, perfect privacy. So you first average F with the perfect privacy um, with this much ratio. And then you get an asymmetric function FP, the blue line here. As I argued, you, you better have a symmetric thing here. So you, you, you have to somehow symmetrize it. When you flip it to get the, the, red, the red line, it turns out that you cannot take the max. You have to take the mean. When you take the mean, you get this, you get this non-convex thing. And then you convexify it by taking the double, double uh, convex. You have this black, black line. So that is what CP does. You can see that CP is really above 
uh, uh, the original app. So it's really am uh, amplifying privacy. Okay. Um, so the right panel shows you that uh, um, we, we do, we actually uh, achieve improvement on the original or classical subsample theorem. So, so the blue line corresponds to the uh, classical theorem, and the red line corresponds to our, our theorem. We, we cannot improve in terms of absent delta because uh, the original one is probably tight. But we 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 achieve the improvement by using more absent and delta. And the okay. proof is by yes. Good question. So this is a bit sort of complicated to represent because of this minimum operation. Is it sim is there like a simpler description in the sort of dual view if you think of the collection of linear lower bounds? So the proof so is via that method. Like that. Uh, Sorry. The proof is why that method. Yeah. So oh, the proof is by reducing. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't really know if there is a nicer uh, representation. We can look it up in the proof. Thank you. Okay. So so we have this uh, improvement, and uh, the more algebraic thing is composition. So the theorem looks like this. If the first one outputs a y is, is fdp, and the second one takes in y and outputs a z, and it's gdp for, for each uh, input. Then the composed mechanism that outputs both and y, y and z is f this tensor gdp. So let me define this tensor. This tensor, this tensor models the trade off of product distributions. So if f is equal to tpqg is equal, equal to this, then the tensor is the trade off. Of, t uh, of uh, product distributions. And that explains why I, I, I use this notation. So there are a few uh, properties. First, it's well defined. It doesn't depend on the choice of PQP prime, Q prime. And second, it's uh, commutative and associative. Uh, that is actually very easy to see. And uh, this perfect privacy serves as an identity in this, in this product. So these are nice algebraic uh, properties. Now, this collection of trade-off functions is, a, if you like the fancy word, is commutative monoid. So if you, if you don't, just forget about it. And uh, so is the, the collection of symmetric uh, trade-off functions. So you may think that I'm just wrapping things up in a, in a not nice uh, way, but, but not really saying anything here. Uh, so let me show you these equations. So the first one shows you that epsilon and delta are separable in this sense. Okay. So it's actually like tensoring with this thing f f zero delta creates is a general way to create delta. And the second is uh, like for mu GDP if you compose it k times then it's exa exactly square root of k mu. Uh, yes. So Jinchuo, does the first one say um, that there are actually two mechanisms that you can apply sort of one after the other? Am I missing that? So, so, so like the fact that it's if the first one is epsilon pure dp, and the second one is epsilon equals zero, and, and delta dp, yeah, then so the composition would be epsilon delta dp. Is that actually what the theorem is saying? Or? Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. yes. Okay. No, I, I don't think so. It talks about the trade-off, not about the actual mechanisms. That's right. But it, but um, because of Blackwell, it implies that you can write any two distributions that are epsilon delta is indistinguishable as post-processing of a very simple kind of signal, which is consists of like two parts. One is the sort of randomized response, and the other is like with probably delta, I tell you the true value. So we should uh, use caution because there's a, a, a for any S and S prime, there's a quantifier there. So, so Right, you can do that separately for each pair of distributions. Right. It's not that but there's a single. translate to a single mechanism in the system. Correct. Oh, okay. And that, 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 that doesn't follow from this deep. That particular statement is like that. You have to fix the thing I just said was like, you know, is all was already known, but not in such a clean. Way. So I think that the point is that we have an equality here. It's not an inequality. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. And uh, let me show you this central limit theorem. So, so in order to explain what is central limit theorem, let me uh, remind you what is random variable central limit theorem. At least for me, it's, it's indicating a phenomenon that, that uh, 
uh, small random effects, no matter what they are, they accumulate to Gaussian if they're scaled correctly. But by scaling, I mean just divide by the standard deviation. So that, that is necessary. And this accumulation is simple adding things up. For privacy, it's similar. It's like small privacy leaks accumulate to GDP if they are scaled correctly. Uh, and this accumulation becomes composition. And, and uh, OK, so, so th here's a, a, a more precise uh, statement. If you have n mechanisms, each one mi is fi dp, then the composition is this much dp by our composition theorem, right? So, so this thing is going to g mu for some mu if uh, these are scaled correctly. Now the biggest problem is what, what do we mean by scaled correctly? So this is, OK, think of this as uh, computing some number from this integral as computing from some number from fi. Uh, when this number accumulate to a constant number, and uh, two similar two similar conditions hold, then we see that it's, uh, it scales correctly. Okay, I don't have time for this detail, and uh, let me show you this very intimidating theorem that uh, this three kind of quantity computed from f, if they accumulate to a, to a constant number, then we have that uh, uh, the composition goes to g mu for some reason. The composition is gd. Yeah, so I, I, want, I, I want to hide away this detail because sorry about that. Okay, so, so let me just show you the takeaways. The takeaway is if you describe mechanism by F, then the limit and their composition is this. Is okay, and there is a very S inversion uh, showing that this is uh, one of the square root of, square root of n away from G mu. And this is a cold chunk that uh, uh, roughly does, does, does this, thing, this thing. So this is just telling you that maybe the, the theorem is intimidating for human, but it's definitely not intimidating for, for machines. Okay. So, so this is a human part, this is a machine part. Okay. Sorry, the limit is pointwise? Yeah, pointwise, uniformly, over zero one. Uh, what's, what's, what's the role of the third moment? Or? Yeah, yeah, so, 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 yeah, 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 very yeah, great. Uh, these are just moments of the log log likelihood ratio. Just, just the same moments. Yeah. Okay, the log okay. uh, Specializing to epsilon delta dp, we don't have uh, those annoying functionals. We just have this condition, okay. and uh, delta can be uh, separately treated. So just like uh, random variable central limit theorem, we can use uh, this central limit theorem to, to approximate things. <laughs> so this paper says like, this thing, this is really almost the easiest kind of you know, composition thing, composition product you can think of. But the, the even, even computing, even local computation is sharp P complete. And they provide F P test that runs in this much time. And our uh, approximation this to this is global, and it, it, it really is minimal. It should add up things. And the various inversion uh, tells you that. So this is a plot showing how well uh, uh, the approximation is. So the, can, you, can you tell there are two lines? Uh, the, the red piecewise linear thing is showing this function, which is uh, tenfold composition of epsilon zero dp, so, so these are scaled well. And the blue line is our central limit theorem uh, prediction. So, so these are really, really, really close. And if you want to use a single epsilon delta to describe this, this exact composition, then you get this dashed line, which is, which is So, so there's actually some problem here because one over square root of ten is actually is actually point three, and uh, it doesn't ex explain why it. it, it, it uh, so Barry-Essen doesn't explain why the approximation is so well. And we have an improved version that's actually showing that uh, uh, the 
square root of n uh, convergence is actually 1 over n. Okay. So, we will mention the, the application. This is a, a comprehensive uh, application because the analysis of F3D heavily depends on a computation theorem and also uh, a substantial theorem. So these are the red lines are our central limit theorem uh, result. The blue lines are, are reported by this paper, which developed the moment accounting method. So, the, so, so just a disclaimer that we did we did not do any experiments. We just we're just analyzing the same algorithm with the same parameters. So we achieve a better bound. Okay. So if you want to see detail, it's uh, in this, this, this uh, level. And now I guess I'll just leave it here and take questions. All right, I just rushed through the. Any questions? All right, so we can uh, ask Jitro about it over lunch. Great, yes, yeah, so remember, uh, if you're affiliated with the privacy semester, there's a photo opportunity right now. We resume at 2 o'clock.